Hello, Trinity Western University. This is Vince Bantu, and it is a blessing to be able to be with you all and share uh, some comments that uh, come from uh, my book, A Multitude of All Peoples, in this lecture that's entitled, Christianity Has Always Been Global. Uh, and this is actually kind of one of the main themes of my book that I'm, I'm blessed to be able to share with you a little bit about. Um, and this is a, a, a topic that's really close to my heart, both as a scholar and as a pastor and an evangelist. Um, you know, I, re I remember when I was uh, actually in, in uh, when I was studying in college uh, at a Christian college as well, and I came across um, a book that was entitled um, uh, "When Christianity Became Global," and uh, and you know that it actually didn't really strike me as odd because I was actually unfortunately used to being introduced to Christian history and theology in a way that basically um, indirectly states that. Christianity and Christian theology has really primarily grown in the continent we now know as Europe, uh, and then later in North America. And, and, you know, in the way that a lot of theology is taught and Christian history is taught, uh, it, it leaves one with the, um, with the belief that Christianity really didn't become global until the modern period, like late 1800s and 1900s, that that's the period that we start talking about Christians in the non-Western world. Um, and, uh, and so I just kind of always used to think that, but part of the reason, uh, that, that this is such an important topic is, um, that, you know, in, in my cultural context of kind of the urban, uh, U.S. context, uh, and many other places around the world, the, the cultural origins of Christianity is a really important topic for a lot of people. It actually, um, especially for non-Christians, actually, uh, a lot of people are really curious about and interested in questions about Christianity's cultural origins, like who Christianity belongs to, culturally speaking. And, and you know, really all of us think this way in a way. I mean, all of us think about certain things, traditions, uh, even religions as belonging to or inherent to a particular culture. You know, for example, I mean, if we're being honest, when we think about Hinduism, for example, we probably all, and if we were to think about what ethnic, cultural, geographical context does that religion belong to, so to speak, or is it closely associated with? And we would probably mostly think of India. Um, and you don't see a lot of, you don't see a whole lot of non-Indian Hindus for the most part. Um, and, and most religions work this way. You know, you think of Islam, you think of the Arabic culture and language. And uh, even though there are people of other religions, but most things work this way. And, and you know, uh, th this works for traditions, uh, like you think of kimchi, you think of Korean culture, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Most things belong to particular cultures. Now, the good news about the gospel of Jesus Christ that we all know is that it does not belong to any one particular culture. Uh, it, it, but that is for it's for all people. And indeed, God had purpose uh, from the very beginning, even from the Old Testament, to uh, make for himself a multitude of all peoples, of all nations, of all every tribe and tongue. Um, so this is the biblical truth. But the perception is that Christianity belongs to a particular culture. Uh, now, it would make a lot of sense uh, in one way for people to associate Christianity with Hebrew culture, for example, because that's where it came from Israel, from Palestine, and uh, Jesus was Hebrew, and all the earliest Christians were Hebrew. Uh, and yet, the New Testament goes out of its way to communicate that the gospel is not only for the Hebrews, but it's actually for Gentiles as well, which means everybody else. And so, um, and so, uh, and so again, uh, the 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 victory is won already in the scripture that again, the gospel is for everybody in Ephesians two, the wall has been broken down and that, the, and that those who are far away have been brought near. Um, and yet we are still living in a time where people think and associate Christianity with particular culture or particular geo racial ethnic context, and particularly with whiteness or with the Western culture and world. Uh, this is an extremely common perception of the world over that Christianity is a Western religion, American religion, or white religion, or white man's religion. Uh, this is a very common perception, uh, especially among non-Western or non-white people. I would actually submit to you that the, um, this, this, this idea or this perception of Christianity being Western or white um, is the single greatest obstacle to the spread of the gospel in the world today. Um, it, and I say that because most people in the world are non-white, non-Western. And when you look at non-Christians in the non-white, non-Western world, um, 
which is most of humanity, actually, the biggest reason in those contexts to reject Christianity or uh, when people are become familiar with the gospel and with Christianity is, is usually not for spiritual or even sometimes theological reasons. It's not usually for reasons of not believing in God, for example, atheism or, you know, kind of putting, pitting science against God or, you know, reasons that you would often see in the Western world. But in the non-Western world, reasons for rejecting Christianity, I would submit to you the number one reason is actually because, precisely because of Christianity's, Christianity's association with white Western culture and therefore the perception that Christianity is antithetical to non-white, non-Western cultural identity. And so for people, for example, in Native American reservations, or for many people in the Black community in the urban U.S., or for many people on the continent of Africa or in the Middle East or, or in East Asia, and so on and so forth, for, again, non-Christians in these contexts, the, percep the perception is Christianity is a white or a Western religion, and therefore it's not a religion of my people. And so there's a, a sense of cultural alienation that people feel uh, with respect to the gospel um, and, uh, and this is, this is precisely why it is so important to emphasize the reality that Christianity has always been a global religion, because here's the thing, if we, if we, if we continue as Christian colleges and seminaries, if we continue to, um, kind of tell the story of Christianity in a way that only highlights kind of its, its first Greco Roman and then European and then North American, uh, and then only after that, in the modern period, global dynamics, then we actually perpetuate this narrative that Christianity came from the West and then went to the rest. Um, and, and this is why it's another reason why it's important to emphasize that Christianity has its origins with a multilingual, multi-ethnic, multiracial Hebrew community that we see in Acts 2. And then from there, it went in every direction. It went west, it went east, it went south in every direction uh, of the known world at that time and continue to spread. And so that's really what I want to uh, just look at, look at a little bit and emphasize, but with, again, that evangelistic and apologetic heart to it. Um, but before that, and, 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 you know, I go into greater detail of, uh, of this in my book, um, one, I want to um, just share some comments with you uh, from a historical standpoint of, of how we got to this point, again, of seeing Christianity as a white or Western religion. And so I, I, would, um, I would submit to you that, that if we look at um, actually the first, um, the first, you know, kind of uh, millennia and a half, or really kind of the, uh, the time period leading up until the uh, transatlantic slave trade and also uh, the era of European colonialism and colonial missions that started in the 15th century, because usually that's where people will start, is thinking about when Europeans began to ex explore the world and colonize the world, and and European missionaries were side by side with them. And that's, you know, in many people's minds, how Christianity became global. And again, I want to provide some comments that that fill out that narrative a bit. But first, I want to talk about how things got to or built up to that point where a certain expression of European Christianity went throughout the world beginning in the 15th century and imposed itself upon uh, many different peoples in the Americas and Africa and in Asia. Um, and, and so there, there are really kind of, I would say, three major dynamics or, or kind of uh, processes that, that happened in the first 15 uh, centuries of, of Christian history and Western Christian history that led up into kind of the full flowering of Western colonial Christianity in the 15th century. The first dynamic that I would submit is uh, what's called identity appropriation. And so this is when the identity of Christianity was appropriated and was linked um, to Western identity. Now, this happened in the fourth century, especially with the Romanization of Christianity, especially in the Roman Empire. And that's the idea that Christianity in the fourth century became seen as a, a an inextricable product of Greco-Roman identity. And this happened primarily through the alleged conversion of the Emperor Constantine in the early fourth century and edicts that he issued that, that actually stopped the persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire. Uh, and then eventually, by the end of the fourth century, led to the dominance of Christians in the Roman Empire. Um, 
And because of that, also Christianity began to really take on lots of Roman culture and adopt actually Roman political and governmental and and uh, and also philosophical concepts and and structures. The, the the church in the Roman Empire began to strongly adopt and and adapt itself to that. And and in many ways, um, Roman Christianity began to function as the nationalizing religion, you know, of, of the Roman empire in many similar ways as the Roman pagan religion used to do. And so, um, this is really where you also see the origins of Christian religious nationalism, which is something that we are still, you know, seeing in 20, in 2021, uh, in the U S uh, in the U S church today. Um, but this is re really where a lot of this starts. Again, the idea that, that, that the church of Jesus Christ is, uh, is, is linked to the destiny of one particular nation that is supposed to be exceptional and is supposed to be divinely destined to govern all others. And, um, and so it, it makes, again, it makes all the sense in the world that, that if, um, if, if something is, co is connected with one particular culture, then the idea is that people who don't fit that culture are not, uh, are not a part of that particular dynamic or that particular, um, uh, uh, product, you know, uh, you know, again, this is how our brains work. This is how we associate, um, uh, pro cultural products, so to speak, or, uh, cultural institutions, um, uh, to use, uh, Peter Berger, sociologist, uh, kind of concepts around how culture comes out of particular values and systems and then and then reach uh, to the level of becoming institutions. You know, for example, like a cultural institution that's been around for, you know, for centuries is the Hebrew culture of the bar mitzvah, right? A bar mitzvah is a rite of passage or a bat mitzvah is a rite of passage for young boys and girls. Now, I would imagine like me, most of us uh, here today that are not Jewish have never had a bar mitzvah or never had a bat mitzvah. And if someone were to ask you, why didn't you have one? We, you, you might answer like me and say, because I'm not Jewish. Like that's, that's for Jewish people, not for my people. So again, this is how our brains work. This is how we categorize information that certain behaviors and traditions and institutions belong to certain people. And if you don't belong to that people, you don't participate in that institution. And, um, and, uh, you know, um, and so this is how religion has worked for mo much of human history. And again, the beauty of Christianity and the gospel is that it's not, it's not, it doesn't belong to any one people, but it's for everybody. But in the beginning in the fourth century, that, that perception changed, uh, in Christianity. And then because of the way in which the Roman empire, uh, in many ways, and the Roman church began to, uh, express and represent Christianity as linked to the Roman empire that began this perception that Christian identity was appropriated by the Roman empire and Christian identity and Roman identity became seen as increasingly synonymous. And again, the problem with that is that if Christianity is becoming to be seen as a Roman thing, then that, then that means logically that someone who's not Roman, uh, cannot or should not be a Christian or that Christi Christianity and non-Roman identity are somehow at odds with each other. And we, and we saw that happen in the fourth century at the same time as Christianity was increasingly becoming seen as Roman for Christians who lived in the Persian empire, beginning with them, their Christian identity and their national and cultural identity became, uh, became seen as in conflict with one another. Now, Persia was the other kind of big dominant empire of the ancient world at this time. And they were Rome's enemy and they were constantly at war with each other. And so, and in fact, Constantine, uh, sent threats to the Persian, uh, Shah when he allegedly became a Christian and, 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 and uh, essentially threatening and forcing the Shah of Persia to take care of the Christians in his empire. Um, otherwise they would go to war. And now Christians in the Persian empire had, been there for the, from the very beginning. We see Persian Christians mentioned in Acts two, Elamites and Medes and Parthians. There, uh, uh, there were there were Persian believers uh, from the very beginning of the church. And in fact, in the first three centuries, it was actually a safer place to be in Persia for a Christian than it was in the Roman Empire. Remember, in the first, second, third century, per Christians in the Roman Empire were being martyred and were being persecuted. But we don't see that happening in the Persian Empire. Uh, and so it's kind of ironic to think about the fact that uh, in the in the, for example, in the first or second or third century it was actually safer to be a Christian in what is now Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan than it would have been to be a Christian in what is now Italy and Greece. Um, but again, in the fourth century, that situation flipped and the Persian Shah began to persecute Christians because 
um, he and many of the other uh, elite of Persia who were mostly Zoroastrians began to see per Christians that were Persian as a threat to them and as those who were sympathetic to the Roman Empire. And that wasn't the case. In fact, many Persian Christians be who were being martyred at this time expressed deep patriotism and deep loyalty to the Persian Empire, saying, no, we, we're Persians, we're not Romans, um, but we're Christians and we're dedicated to the gospel. And many of them went to their death, uh, in, in especially in the 4th and 5th centuries, and there was a direct correlation between the persecution of Christians in Persia and the usurpation or the appropriation of Christian identity in the Roman Empire. And this is a, this, this is a situation that only continued to grow and is still a problem today. There are still so many people, uh, especially Christians of color today, who feel that their cultural identity and their Christian identity are somehow at odds with each other. And the underlying reason for that is because Christian identity is assumed to be inherently a Western thing. And the way Christianity is practiced is the world over assumed to have to only be practiced in a uniquely Western way. And this is, this is very real. Um, this isn't just an academic conversation. I remember uh, once I was teaching a, uh, a class on some of this similar stuff at a Native American Christian school. And I was talking with a, a young man who was connecting with this and, uh, and actually shared with me that uh, this was a Christian young man who was from a particular uh, Native American tribe in the Southwest and who, who shared with me that when he got saved and when he became a Christian, his, some, his tribal elders literally rejected him from his tribe saying, you are no longer a part of our tribe because you have joined the white man's Christianity. And again, um, it, it, there, there are a lot of very valid reasons for why his elders and why his community would have thought that way when we pause to think about that their initial interaction with Christianity was with European American invaders who pushed them off of their land, spread diseases, and then rounded people up and kidnapped children and put them into uh, so-called Christian boarding schools where they were being evangelized, but also the, where the idea was that we need to kill the Indian and save the man, in the words of Richard Henry Pratt. Um, and, the, and, and and Native Americans in these schools all across the U.S. and Canada were, were, uh, were being Christianized, but also were being Europeanized. And the idea was that the more white they acted, the more Christian they acted. And again, whiteness and Christianity were seen as, as synonymous and indigenous culture was seen as evil. They weren't allowed to speak their language or wear their hair long, which is a sacred rite, uh, or practice any of their uh, traditions, which were all seen as demonic and, and European identity was seen as uniquely Christian. So again, this is a dynamic that we're still dealing with that really started all the way back in the fourth century. And then, um, Going forward from that, the second kind of major notch in this dynamic was uh, was a a particular theological hegemony or or a dominance of theology ac according to Greco Roman concepts and wording, and that mainly happened with the um, uh, especially in the Council of Chalcedon. The Council of Chalcedon was a very pivotal church council in the Roman Empire, because again, the Persian Empire actually had their own councils, and there were other councils in other places as well, not just in the Roman Church. But um, but but in the um, in the Roman uh, kind of um, imperial church system, there uh, was a fourth kind of major ecumenical council uh, called the Council of Chalcedon in 451 that was debating how to talk, how to best conceptualize and talk about the full humanity and the full divinity of Jesus. That was a, uh, a you know, the 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 the. Um, the theology or Christology of who Jesus is and and uh, and his divinity was a subject of major controversy in the Roman Church in the fourth century. Then in the fifth century, there was a lot of conversation about how Christians should best talk about the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully human. Well, the Council of Chalcedon had accepted a uh, the articulation of the of the Roman Bishop Leo that articulated that Jesus is his uh, his his divinity and humanity are united in one person. Um, and one who processes, but they exist, but, but his humanity and divinity exist as two distinct natures or physics and kind of where we get the word physics from. Um, and, and that particular way of understanding it was again, a, it was reliant upon these terms that really come from Hellenistic Greek culture, uh, and, and are not, uh, this language and this terminology is not from the Bible, but it's a way of kind of using Hellenistic terminology and the distinction between uh, hypostasis and physis um, in a way that helps to make sense. But the problem is that that particular articulation did not make sense to many Christians in other parts of the world. 
um, especially those who spoke other languages like like Syriac, which was a major Christian language in the Middle East and in, and continuing into Asia, or in Coptic, or or later on in Ge'ez in Ethiopia, that had different words for talking about the distinction between person and nature that didn't exactly line up with the Greek uh, idea, and so. This actually became a major schism. This was really the first major schism in the history of the church where the um, where the, the dominant Roman church accepted this particular way of talking about Jesus as one person, two natures, that again comes from hypothesis and physics. And that became kind of the dominant theology for much of Western Christendom, even to this day, um, you know, Eastern Orthodoxy or Catholicism. And then even later on, as, you know, European Protestantism emerged, many of them just accepted this particular articulation. But... There are still to this day many uh, ancient forms of Christianity that emerged from Africa and from the Middle East uh, and from Asia primarily that did not accept this particular definition uh, and were rejected by the Western Church as heretical. And not only uh, now, now to be fair, they you know they rejected them right back as and they kind of all sides mutually rejected each other and said you guys are all heretics. But the the difference is, and this is I think a good analogy for for example when we talk today about the differences between prejudice and racism for example that all of us can be prejudiced um, and and that's a human tendency an unfortunate human tendency um, but racism is uh, when you have prejudice plus power when you have po social economic and military power to enact or support your prejudices and to benefit one group over another and that was really what the Roman Church had at this time and began to strongly persecute the Christians of, of North and East Africa and the Middle East as well uh, and this was there was 200 years of Christian on Christian violence um, where Roman Christians were going into Africa and the Middle East and attempting to enforce their theology and saying you're not you're not real Christians because you don't say Jesus is one person in two natures whereas in many of the African or Middle Eastern churches, what they call themselves miaphysites, which means one nature, they were arguing that Jesus is one person in one nature. Um, and, and part of the Roman misconception of their theology was that, oh, you don't really believe that Jesus is fully human. You think he's only God. Now, <laughs> that's not at all what, what the Christians of Egypt or Syria believed. Not at all. In fact, from the very beginning, from the fifth century up until this day, they have always affirmed the full humanity and full divinity of Jesus. But they just argued that after the incarnation, when Jesus took on, when the word took on flesh, that his humanity and divinity were united into one nature. Um, but again, you know, a lot of times, uh, but th this is a major issue because even when you, even a lot of times when you read Western uh, church history textbooks, they will often dismiss or or use the same mischaracterizations of these early Christians that their opponents did in the fifth century without even actually having read their own writings. Because again, a lot of the writings that come from these uh, these African and Asian uh, the theologies that were divergent were written in other languages that even to this day, most ch church historians ignore or don't even look at, like things that were, you know, like the writings of Timothy Elyris uh, or the writings of Severus of Antioch that were written in Syriac or the writings of Benjamin of Alexandria who were written in Coptic or the writings of Georgius of Sagla, which were written in, in Ge'ez, or, which is the ancient Ethiopian language. And, and when you actually read these, these authors in their own words, um, you'll find out that they, they completely believe in the full divinity and humanity of Christ. Um, but because they didn't word it exactly the same way as the Roman church did, they were condemned as heretics, but the Roman church had the emperor and the emperor's army on their side. And so what happened was you had, especially in the time of, of Justinian in the 500s, Emperor Justinian, um, who uh, was really advancing the Roman empire and really was kind of at the height of what's the Romans, what's called Byzantine uh, uh, period, was, was uh, strongly going throughout the much of the empire and enforcing this um this uh this particular doctrine into africa and asia and that happened for uh 200 years until the 7th century when much of this area of the world like northeast africa and the middle east then in the 7th century became uh kind of doubly oppressed they had been being oppressed by roman christians but now uh, this part of the world was conquered by Islam by the, in the early uh, followers of Muhammad in the seventh century conquered much of this part of the world and and now uh, and now the uh, the rise of Islam uh, gave way to this third major notch of this process um, that I'm you know that I'm sharing with you uh, and that's what I'm calling the idea of guarding Christendom this this idea that now that the Roman uh, kind of church or Western church as it's now transitioning to be kind of more of a uh, you know various European nations are all being united by this idea of them being this Christian empire 
um, in in many ways the uh, the ascendancy of a new kind of Western Christian superpower was uh, exacerbated in many ways by the emergence of a of an Islamic religious empire to the east, and that also greatly weakened the um, the Eastern Roman Empire, which had up to that point controlled much of the Mediterranean trade. And the Western Roman Empire had already fallen much sooner than this. But then, uh, as, as, as Islam was growing more and more economic and social power throughout the Mediterranean, the, um, the, uh, the next kind of major Western superpower would emerge further to the north, away from the Mediterranean Sea, uh, in you know, kind of areas of what we now call Germany or other parts of Central and Northern Europe. And that was the first major example of that we see in the early 9th century was the Carolingian dynasty. And the Carolingians were uh, Charlemagne, especially their greatest leader, modeled himself like Constantine, uh, called himself like the new Constantine. And, uh, you know, even though the Roman Empire in the West had fallen and this uh, the Carolingian dynasty was now a new Western power, they still modeled themselves over this idea of the Roman Empire being this Christian Western superpower that was meant to be kind of a, uh, a, a counterbalance or a, a competitor to the Islamic um, centers of the of further to the east. Um, and so, uh, and, and not only that, but also internally or in the, in the European region, Charlemagne was also in, involved in very uh, atrocious persecutions of European Christians, where uh, European uh, practitioners of traditional European religion were being persecuted and Christianity was being spread even through Europe by force before it even began to go uh, further to the east. And this, this idea of by, by the 10th and 11th centuries, uh, the idea of the Holy Roman Empire built itself in turn upon the Carolingian dynasty, and you had the Crusades being launched, and for 200 years, these religious wars, um, you know, kind of going into the Middle East and the idea of reclaiming the Holy Land, that this was now, again, the full flowering of a, of a so-called Western uh, Christian superpower, or this idea of Christendom was, this, was, was motivated by this idea that, that the West was the Christian nations, and that were divinely destined to uh, spread Christianity through military force, uh, especially at first, kind of targeting uh, the Islamic East, and 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 even and and you know even after the, that attempt had failed, that's it's that same kind of crusading mentality that led into what we often think of as kind of the full like kind of the beginning of of kind of Western uh, Christian colonialism and imperialism was actually uh, something that was well underway for a long time. In fact, when uh, European kings and, and, the, and the Pope of the Holy Roman Empire and the, and the Roman Church were uh, working together and um, kind of conspiring to go into the rest of the world and, and you know, now going into, starting in the 1400s, going into new areas to them in Africa and, and uh, later on, just a little bit later in the Americas and in other parts of Asia, the <clears throat> the idea was that God again had given these so-called Christian and i.e. European or white countries the ability and the divine right to go into other areas and uh, subjugate them, uh, rape, murder, uh, colonize, and conquer these people, and then enforce Christianity. And many of the European popes were uh, on board with this because the idea was that this would lead to evangelization. The, this is, the, again, the full flowering of the idea that colonialism and conquest can help to open the door for evangelization. And, and so you have famous kind of uh, papal bulls like Romanus Pontifex or Doom Diversus that were issued, say, that were, you know, Western popes granting European kings the speaking on literally literally speaking on on behalf of God saying you have the right and the ability to go into other areas and to uh, subjugate them and conquer and vanquish them in the name of Jesus Christ um, and so again that um, that idea that 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 the West was divinely destined to live and to act in this role was something that was largely um, that was largely kind of uh, motivated by going back a, a millennium before this idea that the Western Christian, the Western world was God's chosen agent in the world to spread Christianity by any and all means necessary. Um, and so again, the, so this is just kind of a, a broad survey or kind of a broad, um, uh, um, kind of, yeah, just kind of a sweeping view of, of a thousand years, but with a particular eye for how, uh, ideas of race and geography and culture played a role in the in in the development of 
this idea of, of Christianity belonging to a particular people group. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so I think one of the encouraging things though, to take away from this is that, um, even though this, there's been a long history and legacy of kind of, of, you know, Western colonial Christendom, that the, that the, the, this is not the beginning of the church. This is not, this is not the origins of Christianity in and of itself. Uh, and that's something I want to pick up next, uh, more, more in depth in the next lecture, um, to show and to identify the idea that, that this is not the totality of Christianity's identity. That's what is often the charge um, that is that is leveled against Christianity, especially again by those who have been um, on the receiving end of colonialism and oppression. That that this is what Christianity completely is, uh, and from its totality. But as I pointed out, this is a process that starts really in the fourth century, um, and Christianity had already had several hundred years of of. Um, of, of being multi-ethnic of in every, you know, in the West, in the East and uh, in the South and the North in every direction and was a multicultural religion that was not associated with any particular, um, you know, uh, kind of ethno-national, nationalistic um, program and was a multi-ethnic religion and has always been, again, a multi-ethnic uh, context and, and religion. And in the second lecture, we're going to talk a little bit more about what that has looked like and resources in that for how we can continue in that legacy that, 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 that Jesus started us on uh, 2,000 years ago.